Okay, so we are live from London. <laughs> See, I told you I'd, I'd sound like a radio host. Uh, welcome to the first of the Hertilla Talks uh, webinar series, where we will be um, featuring each week an expert from the field of reproductive medicine or fertility to delve into some of the really popular topics that we love to discuss at Hertility. Um, it is our daily bread. Um, and Basically, what we wanted to have today was an introductory talk just to talk about fertility 101, to talk about period health and fertility fitness. Those are three very broad topics. But what we know firsthand is that actually there is uh, so much information out there. And despite the amount of information there is out there, so much of it is very confusing, it's misleading. And actually, very often, the more there is to find, the more people shut themselves away. And what we realized actually is that despite the fact that this is, you know, this is our, our as I mentioned, our daily bread, we, this is the, 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 the fertility food we eat every day, which is uh, to learn and to talk about fertility, about ovulation, about periods. Actually, most women don't really understand their cycles. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with poor education, um, the same old textbook graphs and images that we see time and time again, which are misleading, inappropriate and irrelevant to the most, for the most part. And unfortunately, most women do not approach this subject until they're desperately in need of knowing how it works so they can make it work. Um, we are misled into thinking very often that it is so easy to get pregnant. In fact, we are terrified as teenagers and 20 year olds that you could look at a penis and you would get pregnant. And then when we move into our 30s, we realize actually there's a bit of a formulaic um, effort that's needed on, on both um, parts and that it's a lot more difficult and it happens a lot more rarely than you think. So we are a privileged generation of women. And I say this because we have so much choice ahead of us. We get to choose and to prioritize our travel plans, our work plans, our career plans. I always say it that women are in a long-term and committed relationship with their career or their plans. And very often their plan of a family is kind of on the bucket list of would be nice to have, but not essential to have until it becomes something that is more elusive and they, they wonder, can they have it? And then it becomes a desperation factor where they're wondering how are they, go they going to do it? And it, it's really difficult because there's a disparity in our priorities. It, it feels like fertility falls on us to worry about and it's only uh, up to us to worry about getting pregnant. And this is seen world over whereby infertility is consistently blamed on the woman. And it takes two to tango. There's my cat camo cameoing in the background. Um, and we are gonna just talk about, a, we'll, we'll delve into both. We'll have a fully dedicated topic at, uh, later in the year about the male side of male factor infertility. And we'll have some um, experts talking about that. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about how your system works. Um, uh, by way of introduction, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Helen O'Neill and I am the CEO and founder of Hertility Health. Um, furthermore, I am a lecturer in reproductive and molecular genetics at University College London. So teaching about this is my fuel and my, my fury. I find it the most um, important subject. I would say that I'm biased but it is the one area that allows creation and allows people to procreate onto the next generation. So I think uh, our understanding so far of human biology uh, and fertility is lacking severely. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the disinterest in women's health. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that actually some of the changes that we're seeing in terms of demographics are relatively recent. So when I, I go back to saying that we are a privileged generation, the women before us did not have the, the, the privilege of choice. You know, they had arranged marriages, they had um, no choice of having a career, certainly not a choice of having a, um, you know, travel plans or any of these things. And actually in wanting to take it all, we've actually stolen from ourselves a little. And the that is evidenced by the 50% reduction in our fertility rate globally. And that's quite a sad factor when it comes to 
a realization uh, in women that they just didn't know and they assumed that because their mum easily uh, conceived with them that they would be the same and we are a different generation of women as I've, I've mentioned both in terms of our, our goals but also in terms of our experiences so I think it's it's nice to touch on a little bit of that tonight as I mentioned we'll go into much more detail in along the series so I hope you'll join us for the rest of the year we're going to be doing a webinar every month next month we are going to be focusing on endometriosis um, in in honor of endometriosis awareness month and I hope you'll register for that um, we aren't showing any slides tonight, but we are going to send you any learning resources after the webinar. So keep an eye out in your emails and we'll send you some um, links to further resources. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. And I'm going to hand over to Anita, who is probably known by many of you and can definitely do a better job of introducing herself than I will. Thank you, Helen. Uh, so yeah, my name is Dr. Anita Mitra. So interesting little fact about myself is that my surname is the Greek word for uterus, um, which I think is quite interesting because I am a doctor specializing in obstetrics and gynecology. And I speak to women every day about problems with periods and quite often encounter people who are, for example, um, concerned about fertility or, you know, struggling with fertility. And I think one of the most striking things is often that um, there's a lack of understanding. It's really not the fault of the individual. We're just really not taught about that kind of thing in school. And I have to be completely honest with you. I think I only ever really understood about periods when I went to medical school which is a little bit shocking because it's only a small minority of people who actually go to medical school but you know we all have you know I think we'll all deserve to have an understanding of what a period is what's going on in our bodies and yeah I think that just most of us probably were taught at school if you have sex you will get pregnant and then suddenly you want to get pregnant and you're like, oh, hold on a second, why is it not happening? So I think that's why it's really good that we're doing this, you know, just real back to basics, the kind of stuff that, you know, if Helen and I were in charge of sex education at school, this is what you would be learning. Right on. Okay. Well, I think we'd have a bit more fun and we'd definitely show more relevant things than... I definitely think the graph that shows your ovarian reserve decline over time is is a profound and shocking and very relevant one but sometimes the graphs that show the luteal phase the follicular phase uh the ovulatory phase they really don't do much in the way of explaining what uh what is happening throughout your cycle so we'll start with some basics about um getting pregnant, not getting pregnant. Um, I, I do want to say that while well, we'll do a session on preconception uh, care I definitely think there is not enough emphasis on looking after your body prior to getting pregnant. I think it's a it's an undeserved area or underserved area when we talk about getting pregnant and getting your body ready for pregnancy. One of the most fundamental things you have to remember is that if you compared pregnancy to a marathon, then you wouldn't treat it in the same way. So nobody rocks up to a marathon and steps on the, the start line and goes, I think I'll make it, you know. Um, I think you'd be pretty, uh, pretty unsurprised if after a, a half a mile you were panting and spluttering and not, not able for it. And pregnancy is more than a marathon. You know, the marathon, you get to the finish line you think and actually it's only the starting line once you once you deliver so preparing your body for pregnancy is one of the most i guess it's people just don't think that they think they have to stop being bad stop drinking stop you know eating poorly as soon as they get pregnant and up until that point it's free reign and i i really think that this is misleading in the mainstream media because nobody can really do a study thorough enough that says categorically one thing is bad for you and one thing is not. And so many of the headlines are caveated with, well, one glass of wine a day is okay, or, well, it's okay to do this. And actually, I think it's far easier on people if they just have a blanket rule, and that is, no, they're not okay. And we talked a little bit about caffeine before, Anita. Uh, what yeah. are our thoughts on caffeine? 
Well, I mean, I mean, should I declare my uh, extreme interest in caffeine to start with? No, but I mean, I think that, you know, caffeine has always been something that we've always thought, OK, if you're pregnant, you need to um, kind of take it easy. Um, and I, I think that's that's correct. And the, currently the, the national guideline is that really you shouldn't be having more than 200 milligrams of caffeine per day if you are pregnant or trying to conceive. So that means like two good cups of coffee. Um, I always say quality over quantity. But then also there's this recent study that's come out that kind of suggests that maybe no caffeine in pregnancy is safe. And I think this is quite a tricky one for people to to kind of digest because suddenly we're being told, well, actually, probably no caffeine is safe. Well, what I would say is that I think we do have to remember that any kind of study has to take into account other confounding factors. So if you think about I mean, I drink my most amount of caffeine when I'm really, really tired, having a really stressful day, and I've got basically way too much on my plate. And so you have to think about the kind of people who maybe are consuming a lot of caffeine compared to the people who aren't. And I think it's really difficult because if you're drinking a lot of coffee, you know, can you can you reduce? But if you think, gosh, I really can't go without caffeine, then, you know, if you feel comfortable to continue drinking it, then definitely go ahead. But I think it's just... It just makes you think, what am I actually putting into my body and what impact is this having? But also, what is making me take these actions to, for example, drink loads of coffee? And, you know, actually, could you maybe be a bit better with sleep hygiene? Could you actually get, you know, an extra hour, maybe even just start off with half an hour of sleep per night? And actually, that will probably also do you a whole lot of good as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's what's very difficult is that um, as soon as you start... I guess life lecturing. Um, there's probably a lot of you there who would say, "Helen, you 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 literally are fueled on coffee and tea all day." So it's it, it's very pot calling kettle. But at the same time, um, I I do feel like when some people say, I, I feel like there's been this movement towards. It's like you have your your signature coffee in your hand, and now it's also this the, the the wine glass. Like I deserve my wine at the end of the day, and it's such a an annoying narrative because it's it's a false narrative you know like this oh well I couldn't do without my wine and, and therefore I'm not breastfeeding or I couldn't do without my wine and I therefore I'm not going to get pregnant this year is is an excuse and I don't think it's a valid one for anyone to make so much of what we do in terms of our habits like drinking coffee are just habits they're a crutch to make us to give us something to do um so I I always say that you're when you when people always come and they say, oh, what, you know, like about their about their skin, they say, you know, they, their skin looks like um, shit after a night out. And I always say, you you know, your ovaries have been on every single night out, but nobody's putting skincare or doing a skincare routine or doing a detox on their ovaries. Nobody's looking after that. Nobody can see the effects of what your lifestyle have on your ovaries. And they're, then they're surprised when the lifestyle effects affect their fertility so there's a real disconnect at a time in our lives where we are so connected with one another we are at, at a major disconnect with our fertility with our own bodies things go wrong and we just ignore it because we don't have time to address it it's annoying to get sick and so much of period health is an underlying sickness that actually isn't an active sickness mm -hmm. so it's it's something you live with and it's transient. So it comes and goes every month. And we've been taught from a very young age that actually this is par for the course and that we should expect pain. We should expect cramping. We should expect things to be not great. And that's what we want to talk about next is the, the effects that your period could have on your overall well-being and health. So um, we know that we expect our monthly cycle to be so long but actually there the, we also expect when anyone is trying to get pregnant that you will ovulate on day 14 and a huge recent study has shown that actually not all women ovulate on day 14 in fact a large percentage of women do not they ovulate earlier or later and therefore if they're only having sex on their fertile window I always laugh at the expression fertile window it's like a it's like an infertile door or something um they are surprised when they're not getting sex on those days, getting pregnant on those days. So I think more awareness of being in tune with your own cycle is, is really, really important. So the four areas of period health that we want to just briefly talk about tonight 
are regularity, the length of your cycle in general, the length of your bleeding, and you are and the type of bleeding that you have. So generally there are rules to go by. I, th I find sometimes these rules can be damaging, as I just mentioned, we all expect to ovulate, we're, we're told to expect to ovulate on day 14, but at the same time, they're there for a reason. So um, the, of 100 women, let's say 78 will ovulate on day 14. I made that up. Um, but we can we can generalize in terms of our statistics. But what is far less considered and a much wider uh, room for scope is the length of your cycle, um, which generally is 28 to 35 days. Um, and for some women, it's much longer. For some women, it's much shorter. And yet, time and time again, if, if fertility has taught me anything, it's that women have very, very messed up cycles and don't do anything about it. In fact, if they have fewer cycles per year, they're just kind of relieved that they're get, not getting periods. Or if their periods stop in general, they're just kind of relieved that they're not getting periods. Instead of allowing this to be a major red flag to say, hang on, there's this really something not right. So um, in terms of length of cycle, it should be between 28 and 35 days. And if it's any shorter or longer, then you should really be doing something about that. The only times that that's probably something okay with that is if you've just come off contraception or if you've just given birth or had a miscarriage. Any others that I'm missing, Manita? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so we've talked about regularity and length and regularity and length I guess go hand in hand right yeah absolutely and I always think using a tracker is a really good way of just sort of working out what's normal for you as well um, because sometimes I don't know you know if you're really busy and you think I can't really remember how many days was my last cycle um, and you know there's so many great apps out there and it's just a really good way of just being able to kind of flick back and see okay what's happened has something changed over the last few months and also I love it when patients come with an app with all the data there, because normally that's actually one of the first things that we're going to do. We're going to ask you about your cycle. And then if we haven't got like a really good picture of a couple of months, we will actually give you a chart to fill in. And so, you know, it's a bit old fashioned really, isn't it? So if we can have an yeah, app, everyone has great. Their app now. it just makes life so much easier. And I think also it's quite easy to get a bit flustered when you go to the, the doctor and you want to kind of give them this, all this information. So if you can just like whip out the app, honestly, it makes life a breeze. Soon we will have our own fertility period tracking app. It'll be all, all condensed oh, in one place for you, I promise. Um, great. And then one thing that actually doesn't really um, usually get featured on an app is the, is the type of bleeding, um, or rather it doesn't really get signaled to you whether something is irregular. And what's really difficult about this, and we've spoken with um, a number of experts and they say, you know, some women could be hemorrhaging and they'd say, I get heavy bleeding, heavy bleeding. And other women are, you know, having a normal bleed and they think they consider that heavy. Mm. So it's very, very difficult to, to determine. It's, it's really not helpful either on places like the NHS website where they tell you the number of teaspoons of, of blood that you should be passing. Yeah, I know. I mean, but that's the thing as well, you know, like when you look at blood, um, when it's, for example, in the toilet can look loads and actually maybe it's not very much but also when you put blood on on fabric or like on a sanitary towel or something then actually it's quite difficult to to equate how much it is so uh yeah that's always a tricky one but i think it's also really subjective because as you say what some person you know what somebody might not tolerate would seem like a very very light period to someone else and vice versa so i think it's important about what's sort of what you find is too heavy but also if you're consistently passing clots that's something that makes me think oh there's quite a lot of bleeding here but also certainly if you're becoming anemic so if it's causing you to have low hemoglobin levels then that is a really good indicator but again you have to know so basically it's much better to go by the number of <laughs> sanitary products you are changing if you're changing your sanitary products every more than every two hours then or every hour even especially if they're um especially if they are how do you describe a heavy, heavy, super, super plus? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you have a white side vagina and a heavy flow, <laughs> it's better to know through measuring your sanitary products. And actually, amazingly, the moon cup tells you the number of mils yeah. in it. So if we have any moon cup fans out there, they'll, they'll, they'll notice this is a very, very, <laughs> very, very new way of seeing just how much. It's um, so fun when you're like, how much is going to be in there? 
it really, it really is. I definitely don't think outside of lockdown, I would want to be changing it in a public bathroom. Um, but we can, we can have a whole other day on moon cups. Um, so I guess we've talked about regularity, the length of bleeding, the type of bleeding and the length of your cycle. So it's really important essentially just to know um, that is one of the fundamental aspects of your reproductive health. So when any one of those start to change or become irregular, it's critical you check that that something hasn't changed with you in terms of your hormones. So the World Health Organization have classified periods as one of the vital signs, which is unsurprising because when you think about the fact that not just our pituitary gland, but our hypothalamus and our ovaries are all producing chemical signals in the form of hormones, perpetually changing signals in order to account for the changing need in both the uterine environment mm -hmm. and our, I guess, cerebral environment. This really does show you that periods are viewed as this inconvenience, um, a taboo so topic, they're considered dirty. And in fact, they are the main signals for how our, our entire physiology works throughout the month. It's almost as important as your heartbeat, but your period is like that. It's like the pulse of your overall reproductive health. And we know this, and it's mostly spoken about anecdotally about how we are hostage to our hormones and how we only equate the period with meaning you're going to be premenstrual and therefore angry and therefore teary. And in fact, actually, I think the narrative definitely needs to change on this. We are, we now know that when you undergo, when you uh, menstrual cramps, these are the same amount of pressure and um, cramping as you would from a heart attack. That's a huge amount of pain to, under, to sustain, but equally it is, it just shows you that how the narrative makes us look weak. It makes us look pathetic, sad, teary, emotional. And the, the opposite is true because we're going through something immense um, every single given month. So I think um, we're, all, we're, we're all warriors to, to go through that every month. Um, the next, next aspect we wanna not overlook is the fact that when we talk about our cycles, we always give the stage to our periods. And actually the main event is much earlier on so we wanted to have a little bit of a, a session and talk about ovulation because ovulation is something that not many people get symptoms from we're often now recently told have become a lot more aware of cervical mucus because we talk about mucus all the time at fertility um and you know everybody is different so for some people they will say oh yeah i know i'm ovulating because of my cervical mucus and you'll say congratulations uh, or nothing at all. Thanks for sharing is probably what you'll say. But for other women, when they ovulate, it is a crippling, crippling thing. It is very, very painful. Um, Anita, you did a post a while ago and it was it resonated with me so, so uh, clearly. You showed an egg being cracked off the side of a bowl and it was a real whack. And you were like, this is the same as ovulating. It's yeah. like a breaking of a shell, except there's no shell and it can hurt, you know, yeah. think of the power it takes to crack open an egg and okay, we're not, we're not birds, but um, nonetheless, the, the process is somewhat similar and mm -hmm. middle schmerz or, or the German word for middle pain is another word for that pain that you get mid cycle. So Anita, what have you, what are your thoughts on middle schmerz? So um, I think this is something that a lot of people are quite anxious about, but actually it's a sign that you are ovulating. So when your ovary is ready to release an egg, that egg is packaged within what we call a cyst. So a cyst being a fluid filled sac. And I think we're all scared of the word cyst, mm -hmm. but it's actually how the ovaries work is you know, to produce this little cyst with this egg inside. Uh, and so when it's time for it to be released, we get a, a surge of a hormone called LH. And so that luteinizing after, hormone, absolutely. And I always think of this as like the pin that's like popping the the little cyst with the egg in. Um, so that's a signal that the body is ready to release it. It bursts open, and then hopefully your fallopian tube kind of comes and picks up the little egg and then carries it into the the uterus. Now, when this happens, you need lots of 
very clever uh, chemicals to come and, and, and cause this to happen um, because it's not quite as simple as just a pin. And so we know that a little bit of fluid is released. It's a slightly inflammatory reaction. No one's really sure exactly why you get the pain, but some people will feel it's so uncomfortable. I, you know, you would not believe the number of people I've seen in A&E because they've come and they've just had so much pain. And I personally have experienced it myself. Um, I wrote about it in um, my book, actually, because I mentioned about how I was in Fiji um, doing my medical elective there. And I got such terrible pain. I actually thought I had appendicitis. Um, and <laughs> that was not going to be very convenient for me. And then thankfully, I realized I was actually ovulating. And so, yeah, it tends to be sort of it happens for sort of maybe 12, 24 hours. Some people get very, very sharp pain. Some people are sort of more of a cramping, like spasmy pain. Sometimes it can feel like, you know, like really bad IBS. Sometimes people feel quite bloated as well. Um, but it's something that we often recommend that people kind of keep an eye out for to see if it's actually happening because it can be a positive sign of ovulation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen to everyone. It doesn't seem to be associated with any particular problem or disease or, you know, fertility problem or anything like that. But when I did talk about it on my Instagram account, I did notice a lot of people saying that they started to experience it or notice the pain became worse after they'd had a baby, which is really interesting and not something that I've particularly come across in the literature. And I just think that no one's really been that interested to to um, to research it, but we are very interested by this. We are. So <laughs> some of you may be nodding your head. Some of you might be thinking, I've never had this pain before. So, you know, keep an eye see what's happening but that's also why if you kind of keeping an eye on your cycle knowing kind of where you are and then maybe thinking about mm, what's happening with my cervical mucus um, which will tend to be sort of very egg white at that time so that you know the kind of like stringy very clear it's a sign that all the hormones are changing making the right kind of environment for sperm to essentially travel up and get to the egg that's why the body changes the mucus so the all these little subtle signs can just help you think oh, maybe i'm ovulating maybe i'm ovulating or you could wee on an ovulation stick which tells you when the luteinizing hormone has appeared and done its pinpricking um i think it's actually really great for you to actually just talk a little bit about the anatomy of this because so often we talk about hormones and we speak of them in an elusive way because they themselves are difficult to describe their their etiology is not is transient it they they come and they go they are diurnal so they they, they change throughout the day mm. but they don't go so far in explaining what's actually happening what does help in explaining what's actually happening and i remember so so vividly um having the fortune of attending a dissection i was nearly said a live dissection not a live dissection nobody was alive i was alive uh, a dissection of a uterus um and i did throughout my my research for um for my phd and beyond i, I dissected an, an awful lot of uh, mouse uteruses and uteri Hi. and um, ovaries and fallopian tubes and that definitely gave me a much better understanding of, of my own, but it was only seeing firsthand this, this essentially bag. It looked like, it looked like, a, like something of nothing. This bag when these, these tiny little shrivel, okay, they were shriveled because it was a, it was, it was a, a corpse, but these, these little tubes and it, these granular looking fatty tissues that were our ovaries. So your yeah. ovaries are like these really, non-homogenous looking I, that's probably the wrong word it's not going to appeal to anyone or mean anything but it, essentially they look like granular stones and when you cut them in half you see that actually throughout the ovary are various cysts or follicles or um eggs in their different stages of maturity and the language that we use in trying to explain this really really doesn't help so very often when we talk about the ovaries or the eggs we interchangeably use the word cyst follicle mm -hmm. um preovulatory follicle uh, we talk about follicular genesis instead of just talking about an egg growing into maturity mm -hmm. until it is ready to be passed out through the egg so when you when you think about your this your fallopian tube and your egg sorry your your 
your ovary and this little egg going into the fallopian tube and down into your uterus so this very unimpressive looking bag which was like a deflated balloon was the uterus and and I, I know that sounds probably unhelpful but but for me it was it was so profound I stood there pressing my own uterus going hmm, no wonder no wonder you can feel your bladder underneath it because it sits right underneath it but essentially I think the language that we use when we talk about our anatomy doesn't really help us understand and this is mm. often compounded by some um reproductive disorders like polycystic ovarian syndrome when we talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome we don't mean that you have loads of cysts and cysts cysts are bad things in your ovaries we're merely talking about the structural appearance of your ovary and that is that it has multiple potential eggs um most of them probably won't form um a mature egg that could be fertilized most of them are just it's just the, the presence and you can have polycystic ovaries without having polycystic ovarian syndrome. So uh, the, the distinction is very important because polycystic ovarian syndrome leads to another, to a whole class of um, effects with your hormones that can have systemic effects on the rest of your body. But we are, when we talk about ovulating, I think it's, I think it's really great mentally to have an exercise where you imagine this egg bursting and going down your fallopian tube and into your I guess womb or waiting along the fallopian tube for a sperm to arrive to the party um and the sperm gets overlooked far far too often so we the last thing that we're going to talk about tonight before we open up to just some questions is at fertility fitness now I am very aware that calling fertility fitness assumes some element of liability uh, that you could be unfit as a result of your own doing. Far from it, we are incredibly aware that there that it takes two to tango. Fertility is a game between two gametes, a sperm and an egg, and it really, it really matters when one doesn't work, the other could be working perfectly. And I really want to ca caveat that for anybody who's doing a fertility test, that you get your results and everything is, is rosy. It still may not mean that you are getting pregnant. So it's important to check your partner. But more than that, one thing that we are committed to doing at fertility is driving this forward through research. So um, it's one of the things that Anita and I really bonded over was our passion for some of the things like you just mentioned that just aren't really a thing um aren't really spoken of and certainly aren't written about in the literature um so we are on hopefully a mission to change that and every week we have a i i have my lab meeting with my amazing research team you, they don't they don't get featured i feel like you're all used to seeing my face everywhere which is very annoying for me but um one of the things that we are very aware of and we're trying to build out with fertility is the fact that there are actually 11 potential forms of female infertility you could fail to ovulate in general so we've just we've had a whole section on talking about ovulating but you could actually not be ovulating at all so it's important to check that if you're not getting pregnant you could have problems in your menstrual cycle so we've already mentioned the problems in your menstrual cycle that very often we just take as a given you could have structural problems in your reproductive system part of my my phd thesis was looking at the at, at disorders of sexual differentiation um which occur in one in 500 people that's a lot of people um you could have previous infections and again this is really important to notice for anybody who has ha again a, a perfect result it's part of the reason that we include symptoms and we ask questions and we really hope you're honest about any former sexually transmitted infections some inf infections or prior infections can have a reducing effect on your fertility so they can cause structural problems with your fallopian tubes or scarring um so again if you have difficulty getting pregnant and have had a perfect hormone result but there, it's important that you're honest about um, previous infections because we've we've in, in, um, incorporated that into our questioning. Uh, other areas that could form or could cause female infertility are failure of the egg to mature properly, or you could have implantation failure of the embryo for various reasons. One such reason is endometriosis, um, which causes a buildup of um, endometrial tissue in your 
uterus, sometimes on your ovaries, sometimes on your bowel. And I think that's a really key point that you touched on earlier, Anita, when you said some people get pain in their bowel, some people get bloated. It's very easy to confuse the pains that you get so very often people with endometriosis are confused with having irritable bowel syndrome and it's because as I mentioned and there was it was all very much compounded to me when I when I saw this um dissection is that everything is squished in in one place so it's very difficult to discern between one pain and another and especially when when your organs are all squished in on top of each other so I think really listening to your body is a very, very important thing for far too often we we ignore it. Um, and then autoimmune disorders can have an effect on your fertility. Polycystic ovarian syndrome can as well, by mostly by dint of causing um, irregularity in your ovulation and fibroids as well, which are very common um, among a lot of people and get misdiagnosed. Have I missed anything? No, I don't think so. Um, just one thing to add is autoimmune conditions. So things that are quite common, particularly in females, a, a thyroid disease is really quite common. Um, and that's often something that isn't diagnosed until we're actually doing investigations. Um, and so, you know, if you've got a family history of thyroid disease, definitely that's also one to consider. I, I'm really, really glad you mentioned thyroid um, because there are some studies that say up to 20% of all women have a problem with their thyroid function. Mm. And the symptoms of thyroid um, dysfunction are very insidious. So generally they're fatigue or loss of appetite or increase of appetite, but they're, none of them speak so loudly as to say, oh, this is definitely thyroid. And so women go for years, you know, with low sex drive or all of these symptoms. And they just assume, unfortunately, our lives are such that we're all tired all the time. We're all exhausted all the time because we're all doing so much. Um, so it, it doesn't really necessarily, th somebody goes to the doctor, they don't feel well. And they say, well, maybe you should take some iron, which could be true if they're having heavy periods. But if their periods become irregular, again, then everything gets clustered into this confusion over what could be going wrong. And this expectation that things just do go wrong. So we think it's really important to check your, your thyroid function for sure. Um, and that's why we always check th everybody's thyroid function on all of our tests. We check um, thyroid function as well as all of your cycling hormones and anything that's, that's relevant um, to you. So we have 20 minutes left. Um, we will head over and we'll do a few questions, I think. Um, we are just, how many have we got here? We've got 15 questions. So, okay, let's, let's open this up. So I've seen one that I'm going to answer quickly while you're having a look through, Helen. Right. So is it true that your fallopian tubes can move and collect eggs from opposite ovaries if one tube isn't doing its job? Yes. So, um, I... I think a lot of people don't realize that the fallopian tube isn't fixed to the ovary. So remember that you've got your uterus, which is in the middle, and then you've got a fallopian tube that comes off each side and it's got little like, we call it fimbrial end. Um, and so when you see it, it looks very red. And you know, like if you look at your tongue, it's got like very tiny little like papillae. It's the same kind of thing on the ends of the fallopian tube. And so the ovary is normally found underneath each fallopian tube and it can kind of picks up the egg, but it can go to the other side and pick up an egg from there if everything is nice and mobile. Okay, so that's assuming that you don't, for example, have um, really bad endometriosis or really bad adhesions. So adhesions are scar tissue, and that's why we mention about infections, for example, can be a common cause of, of getting adhesions. So the reason that we are so sure that you can pick up an egg from the other side is that when we see people who've had one fallopian tube removed, that's when we can kind of tell. So when we do scans in early pregnancy, we can tell you which ovary you released an egg from because you have something called a corpus luteum, which is kind of the shell of the egg left behind. So for example, a few weeks ago, I scanned a patient who had a, her left tube removed. So she only had the right tube left but the corpus luteum was on left ovary. So the right tube had gone over, picked up from the left ovary and then taken it in. Isn't that cool? That's amazing. That's amazing. 
I didn't know that. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, great. I'm looking here and there's another question here is saying, um, it's a lot of questions. I'm glad we left 20 minutes for this. Um, <laughs> do you have any advice on further tests that can be done beyond AMH and follicular scan? We've been told that other tests are only possible if we begin IVF and keep trying to keep trying in the meantime, both of us have normal, uh, low normal AMH and sperm count. Um, I would definitely say that the other hormones in, in concert that affect your ovulation and period are very important. Um, not to preach a fertility test, but we measure more. Than, this is why we people ask us all the time, well, can you just measure my AMH? And we say, no, we don't just measure AMH because it is context dependent. First of all, AMH isn't the be all and end all when it comes to your fertility. It is an incredibly good biomarker for letting us know how many uh, potential eggs you have left. But what's really important are your other um, cycling hormones, FSH, LH, estradiol, um, your thyroid function. So I would definitely say that much more than an AMH and antral follicle count scan are important in determining where, whether things are going wrong. Um, and especially if you have any symptoms, we generally test things uh, according to your symptoms. Um, somebody else has said, actually, there's quite a few questions about coming off the pill and fertility and how long, how soon after stopping the pill, can you expect your reproductive system to be back to normal? So a recent paper looking at um, about 5,000 women came out where they looked at the return of um, periods after cessation of their given um, form of contraception. They looked at um, combined oral contraception, they looked at uh, progesterone only, they looked at um, intrauterine device from both the copper coil and the hormonal and non-hormonal intrauterine device. Um, they looked at all of the hormones and what we dedicated a whole um, a whole lab meeting to this where all of our researchers took uh, given contraception and we dissected how long it was and the, the long answer and the short answer is that every single one is different. So the longest amount of time uh, that it took for somebody's or for, for people's periods to return was eight months. Some of them returned within one month. Um, it really does depend on your form of contraceptive pill. I'm going to um, put together a summary of this paper and put it in the link for your um, additional reading, because I think it would actually be really great for people to be able to look this up afterwards and to say, actually, I've just come off progesterone only. So we will provide um, information about about return of fertility post um, cessation of your contraception soon. Um, and then another question, I think, and we get this all the time is how, what, what effect does, um, what effect does the pill have on fertility? So, uh, you know, this, this is a controversial one. So many studies will say the pill does not have any effect on your fertility. This makes me very angry. As a researcher, there is no way of categorically saying that a given pill does not have effect on a given person's fertility. Unless we did a study on one particular pill or one particular type of, of hormonal contraception with the same doses, so let's just say the same brand name, we know exactly what you're getting in terms of your progesterone or, or, um, or estrogen. And we did this on every woman from the age of 25 to 35 or we did it on every woman that was all 35 year old, every 35 year old woman, only then could we, who was on it for the same amount of time, only then could we start to say, this pill, it doesn't seem has an effect. But unfortunately, we are now starting our contraception at a very young age, not coming off given form of contraception for a long time, or we'll have changed form of, forms of contraception six or seven times or even twice, depending on its effect on us every single person has a very different reaction to the pill they're on. I speak to some people who had, who that their go-to pill is, uh, is one thing. Um, the same pill on me made me incredibly angry, emotional, fat, um, probably <laughs> those because of the, the, the latter. Um, and, and I, I really think there's just not enough out there. And it, it, it's a very easy thing to say, yes, we looked at 5,000 women and actually it doesn't affect your fertility. But the facts are, we are now at a stage where sometimes it, it's one in six is quoted. Sometimes it's one in seven that's quoted, but one in six to seven people are infertile. 
so much of that has to do with our lifestyle. So much of that has to do with our willingness to put off um, for our starting our families. So much of it has to do with our, I guess, lack of choice anymore. We don't have a partner. We don't have um, the ability to just get pregnant with anyone. We do, however, have the ability to, you know, assess our fertility and assess our current situation and say whether well if I if my fertility is this and my current situation is that um it doesn't look like there's going to be a baby on the cards in the next year so maybe I should do something about this um but truthfully to if I was to say that I knew I don't think uh, that would be a reliable thing to say I think every single person is different every single um fertility journey and I mean that in, in terms of your contraception um and your health are all very different so sorry for the very long answer that is probably not satisfying but I I just I don't think it's um I don't think it's a, a I think it don't think it's easy to say it's a I difficult one isn't it because I think I think also we think about the reasons why people may be on on contraception um, and often studies don't necessarily take this into account. So, for example, some people may be using the pill actually not to stop them getting pregnant, but um, because they actually have terrible period pain or because they have very heavy periods. Um, you know, maybe that's because they have underlying endometriosis, for example. Um, often maybe people haven't really known their cycle, then gone onto the pill and thought, oh, my periods are now irregular, but actually maybe it was actually like that beforehand. So it's really difficult because I just think that there's too many different variables to take into to consideration. Um, but I think that lots of people always say, well, what, what should I do when I'm, when I'm coming off the pill and what's going to happen? And I think it's really difficult to predict. And it, sometimes I find it a little bit difficult to reassure people because it, it, you only will find out by actually trying. Um, and just also to say that you know, not everyone's going to find that their periods are irregular and that if you do stop some form of hormonal contraception it is possible to get pregnant straight away so if you don't want to get pregnant and you're just stopping the contraception because you want to stop it then you need to use some other form of contraception and if you are planning on trying to conceive then you know you should be taking folic acid beforehand um, because it might actually happen really quickly yeah very very true um so there's some questions here about um about regularity of cycles so how do we if you have an irregular cycle can you is there anything you can do to lengthen it if you have a, a, a so one one question is i have a short luteal phase which is 11 days can this prevent me getting pregnant mm -hmm. is there anything i can do to lengthen it it's a really difficult one. And I think it really depends on, you know, is there anything when you're thinking about sort of fertility and what is happening with your cycle? Is there anything that actually lifestyle wise you think you could modify? Because often I think we really um, don't appreciate how much the other things that we do in our life actually has an impact on our um, hormones. Your ovaries are not just pumping away on their own. They're getting signals from the adrenal glands. They're getting signals from the thyroid gland, as we mentioned before, uh, and predominantly from the brain. So lots of things that can change can actually impact on the pattern and the amount of hormone production and it requires quite tight control. So that's why, for example, I saw somebody else um, asked in the, the um, questions about um, long haul travel. So long haul travel is something that your body kind of senses as a stress because it's suddenly, you know, maybe having to be awake at what's three in the morning to your body clock, but you're awake, you're exposed to unnatural light, you're eating when your body's not expecting it so all these brain signals are you know in some way being transferred to the ovaries and that's exactly what happens when you actually end up on the sofa at 1am like binge watching a netflix series and then you know maybe eating lots in the middle of the night or you know maybe you know things that you can't control you know is your baby waking you up at night, for example, or, you know, have you got really noisy neighbors or, you know, so many things. So sleep is super, super crucial. So they I say there's that that people who work night shifts. It's one of the things if, if we get an abnormal hormone result, one of the first questions you ask is, are you working night shifts? And, and that oh, is yeah. a prime I know example. That one. <laughs> exactly. That is a prime example of how you can stress your endocrine system. So your system that creates your hormones. Yeah. Absolutely. So I would just say, you know, try and think about the things that you can control. So yeah, definitely your sleep, 
stress is always a difficult one because I find that that can come across a bit of a patronizing message sometimes as well it's like yeah just chill out well you know it's so much easier said than yeah done, and actually but... somebody's just mentioned that about um in one of your questions you said about tracking your ovulation and that mm. it, you know you've been told that people find it stressful yeah oh it's... my gosh definitely so so it, I think it's actually really important to track your ovulation and know roughly when in the if you roughly when in the month it is but to do it religiously I think if it causes you stress and a lot of people end up saying when they're trying to conceive sex is no longer fun um and that's because it's you know right let's go um and I think there's well no I don't think I know stress causes raised levels of cortisol and cortisol suppresses oh ovulation um it has all sorts of other effects on your body so the anecdotal use of oh you know stress causes infertility is actually unfortunately far more biological or biochemical than we give it credit so i think there's an awful lot more to be said for yeah. and that's perhaps why you know so, some um more re relaxation treatments and things like acupuncture are are associated with increasing people's fertility I think a, a lot more of it has to do with somebody's trust that something um, is going to help them get pregnant and therefore a reduction of a, a pathological amount of stress so it's mm. it's like when somebody tells you in an argument to calm down it's very difficult to calm down um, totally uh, and it's very very difficult when you're trying to get pregnant and you're told um, to to relax um, yeah. but unfortunately when you it, I think actually it goes a long way when you think of it less as being a psychological thing and more of it being a as, as being a biochemical thing to try and do all of the things that you can to protect yourself from any external stress um because mm. if you think of stress as being something that cr causes creation of a chemical that can affect your ability to ovulate then I feel like it must be a bit bit easier to to I guess to come to terms with psychologically hopefully yeah, absolutely um, I think as well just the, um, just to go back to the sort of tracking ovulation um, religiously is that um, I mean I think that your ovulation kits at home can be really useful but I think sometimes people sort of don't use them quite correctly um, because when you actually notice that LH surge so you know about the pin that I was saying about to to release the egg then actually you kind of almost pass the peak fertility point of your fertile window because you're actually, you shouldn't be waiting for ovulation. Actually, your highest chance of getting pregnant is, is when you have intercourse about two days before you ovulate. Um, and so I think often if you're waiting for ovulation, waiting for that positive sign, then you may have missed the boat. Um, and so that's always a little bit of a concern um, if you are really tracking ovulation religiously. So that's why um, that's we really, talk about the really fertile window point. and the that, peak that, being that the LH approximately two after. days before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's quite an important point. And also just, um, I'm sure lots of people who are um, watching this may have PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, and people with PCOS will naturally have um, a higher um, basal rate, uh, amount, sorry, a basal amount of LH. And so you can pick up a positive um, test on many days. And so if you are doing your home ovulation kits and you're getting multiple positive readings on in one month then something is going wrong because you only have that one pin and so that's why i always talk about it as a pin because i'm used to talking about uh, this with people with pcos and i always say that you know if you have pcos you can have lots of lh surges okay this is not a, a freaky dance it's basically because your body is trying so hard with that pin it's like come on let's go let's go let's go and so you've got lots of lh surges throughout the month desperately trying to get that egg out uh, and so yeah if you have more than one you're not ovulating more than once you can only ovulate once in a month if you're having a normal cycle which is producing a nice juicy egg so that is a sign that mm, something's not quite right here so that, that's why if you have pcos it's a little bit tricky often with um with your ovulation kits and that's the problem. I think we we like to think that there's a one uh, one size fits all approach to fertility. And when we started with creating these tests, um, a lot of people just said, just do the same test for everyone. And we refused point blank. You know, we got out the, the textbooks and we were like, 
what what if somebody has these combination of symptoms so um to to give an overview of what we test and how we test it we created this it with this in mind so we collected all of the symptoms and all of the diagnostic guidelines from all of the main bodies professional bodies um which are there to help doctors prescribe or help doctors diagnose certain conditions so we took all of the symptoms um that could in 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 isolation or in accumulation with multiple different symptoms and including your kind of information about you what your background is what your ethnicity is we know that di different ethnicities have different um are, are prone to more different conditions and so we collect collected all of them to enable us to determine which hormones we should test you for so um i think that is we are really moving towards an era of personalized medicine where we take into account an individual's um reproductive history their life history their contraceptive history their infectious history all of these things and then we combine it with the potential partner to give us a better insight into your ability to conceive but it is a really really complex area when you're talking about periods the time of your period ovulation when you are creating an egg um, when you're talking about your hormones and how, what they have to do all at the right time, it really is like a complex calculus of different chemical signals as well as, well as physical entities that are happening within your body. We, we didn't even talk about the uterus and how it how it all lines up in, in preparation for an, an embryo to arrive or a, an implant inside it for a pregnancy. And it's very, very, um, you know, unbelievable that our bodies expect us to do this every single month um but it is really really difficult then when the simple answer is you're not getting pregnant there are so many different ways in which um could be causing it but we are on a mission to get to the bottom of infertility to create a fertility triage system through fertility so please stick with us for our journey please um join us next time for our next webinar on endometriosis Please, please tell your friends about this. This may not be uh, applicable to you, but it will definitely help a friend of yours, your cousin, your sister, your your male friends too. They've all got girlfriends, sisters, and, and aunties as well. So um, Anita, it has been a pleasure having you. I hope we can do more regular sessions. It's great to be able to brainstorm. I'm a scientist, you're a clinician. So we get both sides of the, the table. Um, we will wrap up because it is now nine o'clock and I don't want to take more, any more of anyone else's time. It's we are going to away time and try and answer as many as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We will be, this has been recorded, so we will be sharing the link with you. So if you didn't have time to stay, um, then hopefully you'll be able to catch it up on demand. <laughs> Take care, everyone. And thanks, Anita.